this thing. I think I'd be used to it. So, good morning. Let's see. Have any of you heard of Zeno's Paradox? No, it's it's quite a famous little problem. Come on, Zoom. Trying to reclaim the left hand of the board. There we go. So Zeno was a Greek philosopher. And he argued, it's hard to know how seriously, because none of his work actually survives, but he argued very famously that motion is impossible. And the argument he used was this. Suppose we're trying to travel from A to B. Well, before we can travel from A to B, we have to get halfway to B. And getting halfway to B requires some amount of time. So we can't just go to B. We first, we have to do something first. We have to reach this point. And then, to travel from this midpoint to B, well, we have to do something first. We have to reach that point, and reaching that point takes some amount of time. And then, you no, know, before we can reach B, we have to reach that point, and reaching that point takes some amount of time, and so on. We can never reach B, claimed Zeno, because there's always something we have to do first, and the thing we have to do first always consumes some amount of time. So that's probably not really convincing to most of us, but I mean, what Zeno was observing is that you can take this interval from A to B and you can chop it into infinitely many pieces. And even though there are infinitely many pieces, when you put them all together, you get the finite interval. So, for example, if this is going from zero to one, this first piece is a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-tooth, and so on. And these pieces all together make one. Well, if you want to put a bunch of lengths together, the putting together operation is addition. So what we're saying here is that we can add an infinite number of numbers together and wind up with a finite sum, wind up with one in this case. Definition, a series is infinite addition. And I mean, we'll define stuff more formally down the line, but we've looked at sums like this, 
where we're starting at one and ending at some finite number. A series occurs when we delete that finite number and put an infinite sign there. So we're adding an infinite number of terms. And I mean, the Greeks didn't have any systematic way of working with infinity, which is probably why Zeno found this so baffling. We've done enough with infinity that it's probably not super surprising that we should be able to add an infinite number of things together and get a finite number. I mean, just as another example, We've looked at areas under curves where this region extends infinitely in that direction. One way of thinking about that would be to cut the number line into pieces and say, well, that area is some finite area. And that area is some finite area. And this area is some finite area. And we do this infinitely often, and we end up with infinitely many areas. And because we know this big area is finite, or it can be finite, um, the sums of those smaller areas is finite. So just as with the integrals we looked at that involved infinity, a sum, an infinite series, might have a finite value or it might not. I mean, here it's, I hope, pretty geometrically clear that this sum is equal to one, but it probably won't surprise you if I say that adding one to itself over and over again does not have a finite value. So every one we add, we get closer to infinity, and this sum would be said to be infinite. So what we need is a definition of what it means. What does it mean for a sum to exist? a series to exist, as it were? What does it mean for a series to not be finite? Um, I'm sort of struggling to say this because I haven't put the relevant definitions on the board yet. Um, so this is going to be very similar to like, um, well, to the derivatives or to the integral, where in both those cases, we had a formal definition, the limit of a difference quotient, the limit of a Riemann sum. But once we really started working with those, that limit definition kind of faded into the background. So, Let's say we're looking at, oh, let's just go from one to infinity for now. Say we're looking at a sum that looks like this. Uh, probably I shouldn't be using N for the subscript. It's probably more common to use K because I, want to use M now, or N now, the nth partial sum, 
is the sum from 1 to n of a sub n. So going back here, the first partial sum is one half, the second partial sum is one half plus one fourth, the third partial sum is one half plus one fourth plus one eighth and so on. And you can maybe kind of guess what we're going to do. It's very similar to how we dealt with improper integrals. Um, we don't know how to define a sum from one to infinity, but this partial sum always exists. And presumably the later partial sums are doing a pretty good job of approximating the total sum. So we say, that an infinite sum is a limit. Ah, I keep, keep falling into the error. We can't use n in the multiple places. Our subscript has to be k there and k there, if we're going to have that n at the top. So this definition, I hope, um, makes sense. Let's take a look at an example. And, you know, doing examples of sums by hand is kind of a pain. Let me, I know Wolfram Alpha isn't the best in a classroom because you can't magnify stuff and make it easy for the students to read, but so. I just typed in, what's the sum from one to infinity of one over two to the power of n? And Wolfram Alpha told me, well, that sum is one. And what I just did is I asked Wolfram Alpha, to verify this statement for me. Notice this is one over two to the first, this is one over two to the second, this is one over two to the third, and so on. So this is one over the powers of two. And I asked Wolfram Alpha, if we take all of these powers and add them together, what do we wind up with? And Wolfram Alpha told us, well, this sum is one. Let's have Wolfram Alpha generate some partial sums for us. So the first partial sum is one over two to the first, which is one half. The second partial sum is one over two to the first, plus one over two squared, 
which is three fourths. Let's find the fifth partial sum. So just as a reminder, this is the sum from one to five, one over two to the K. So it's one over two to the first, plus one over two to the second, plus one over two cubed, plus one over two to the fourth, plus one over two to the fifth. And the reason I pulled Wolfram Alpha up is that it's going to do this sum for us very quickly. I'm going to delete infinity and put in five, and we get 0.96875. Let's Let's find the 20th partial sum. This would be enormously annoying to do with our calculator because we have to type in 20 fractions and add them together. Again, the reason I am using Wolfram Alpha, even though it's not great to look at, is that it makes it very easy to do this quickly. 0 0.999999. If I counted correctly, that was six nines followed by some other stuff. If we then, I'm not going to start a new frame, I'm just going to try to claim a little space here. S sub 500, the 500th partial sum. I mean, Wolfram Alpha might just end up rounding this to one, but let's find out. Let's find out. Ha, I pressed the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so up to up to however many decimal points this is, this is one. I mean, there's some kind of rounding error, but even Wolfram Alpha, which is a very powerful tool, can't give us the example or can't give us the answer except to say, well, up to 30 decimal places or whatever this is, this partial sum is one. So let me scribble that out and put in the approximately equal sign. And let me write that this is approximately equal to one. <laughs> so, um, going back to what I said earlier, here this infinite sum exists and it's equal to one. It's perfectly simple to write down infinite sums that don't exist. In fact, most infinite sums aren't going to exist if you add an infinite number of things together and you get a finite value back, that's pretty special. But let's see, the example I gave was just 
adding an infinite number of ones together. And I said, well, this doesn't exist. And I mean, the first partial sum is one. The second partial sum is two. The third partial sum is three. The nth partial sum is n, one added to itself an infinite number of times. And the limit as n goes to infinity of these partial sums is therefore infinite. So this limit doesn't exist. So the series diverges. That's the word I, when it seemed like I was having trouble speaking, it was because I was trying to not use the words converge and diverge before I defined them. If this infinite sum, exists in the sense that the limit as n goes to infinity of the partial sums exists. The series converges if this does not exist in the sense that the limit of the partial sums does not exist. We say the series diverges. So we're just borrowing the terminology we used when we talked about limits. We talk about limits converging or diverging. So now we talk about series converging or diverging. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, might be coming down with something. Um, let's look at kind of an interesting example, or at least I think it's interesting. What can I say? This example is called Grandy's Series. And it's the sum from one to infinity of negative one to the n minus first power. So if you sort of wrote this out, it's one minus one plus one minus one plus one repeated infinitely often. Um, Grandy's series is interesting to me for a number of reasons, a lot of them historical. I know it probably seems like when we sort of learn math for the first time that we're often very finicky. I mean, about, you know, definitions, about, well, about definitions. 
I mean, you could do differential calculus without ever defining the derivative in terms of a rate of change, or rather in terms of a limit of a difference quotient. You would, um, in fact, Leibniz did. Um, so did Newton. Limits were a later invention. Leibniz and Newton both defined um, the derivative in these very kind of fishy sounding, very informal ways. And, you know, it worked. Newton wrote Principia Mathematica. But there are times when not having formal definitions really runs you into problems. And at one time, you know, just like when we were talking about the derivative, Newton and Leibniz defined the derivative and used the derivative, even though they didn't have a really good definition. Um, people were working with infinite sums long before the word partial sum ever left anybody's lips. And they were mostly successful, and they mostly got sort of good results. But one of kind of the minor mysteries of mathematics for a long time was, does this series converge? And if so, to what? And a lot of very prominent mathematicians, for reasons that we won't get into, but a lot of very prominent mathematicians thought this ought to equal one half. Basically because it's alternating between zero and one. So, you know, one half is halfway between zero and one. And when I say really prominent mathematicians. I mean really prominent mathematicians like Leonhard Euler, who most people would probably say is the greatest mathematician to ever live, came down on this side of things. And I mean, the reason you could argue about this, again, was because in the early days of calculus, nobody really had clear definitions for what any of this stuff meant. They just sort of understood it intuitively. And Brandy's series was causing this intuition to break down. Now that we've defined this formally, we can do what some of the best mathematicians who ever lived couldn't. And we can answer the question in the negative. Brandy's series diverges. So you look at the list one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and you ask what number this is converging to, and you find that it's not converging to a finite number. And because the sequence of partial sums is not converging to a finite number, 
Brandy is series is not converging to a finite number. So if any of you wind up in Mr. Vogel's classes, he teaches the high level theory and you find yourself thinking, what's the point of this? Why would anybody care? Um, it's it's a historical, I mean, I mean, it has this historical reason that for millennia people were trying to do mathematics without those formal definitions and without that formalism, and it ended up running into trouble. There's a very, I wish I could remember the entire name, but it's back from when, you know, books would have like names that were entire sentences, um, but there was a very famous book by a bishop um, to an infidel mathematician, which basically argued that um, calculus was a matter of sort of a religious faith because people were doing all of this nonsense and they couldn't explain why it worked. So, um, Mr. Vogel's 400 level math classes are kind of a reaction to all of that. Um, I also like Brandy's um, series just because I find it very interesting when mathematics sort of intersects with other disciplines you might not expect mathematics to intersect with. In this case, the intersection is with church history. Grandi was a Roman Catholic monk. Um, you know, sort of the, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of proto-Jesuit um, doing a lot of sort of research and stuff. And as a monk, as a very religious person, Grandi, um, imbued this series with religious significance, because what Grandy noticed is that if you take this series and you add in parentheses, like we're used to doing, you can make it equal different things. So Grandy started looking at this. And what Grandy noticed is that if we put parentheses in, like this, this series really ought to equal zero because all of these terms are turning to zero. And when you add zero to itself, you get zero. So this really ought to be zero. But then the grandy noticed, well, you can rewrite this as one minus one minus one minus one minus one, minus one minus one. And if you think of this in any kind of intuitive way, it really ought to equal one. Let's see, I think I did this right. One minus one plus one, minus, yep, that's correct. So I said that Grandy imbued this with religious significance. He saw it as an analogous to the creation of the world ex nihilo, the idea that because God is omnipotent, he can create something from nothing. And Grandy looked at this and he said, well, something is being created from nothing. <clears throat> Well, that's kind of a historical side note. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? 
then let me make the observation that in general, it's very hard to know whether a series converges or diverges. And this is one of those statements that sounds worse than it is, because it's taking what's really a statement about pure mathematics and crafting it onto an applied mathematics topic. You know, it might seem hard to believe at the moment, but these infinite sums are a very applied topic. We want to use them for real world stuff. And in the problems they show up in, in the real world, this isn't going to be a huge issue. We're just going to work with series and they're going to converge and everything will be fine. So I don't want to overstate this. At the same time, you know, just like you can very easily write down integrals that we can't take by hand, we can very easily write down series. whose convergence or divergence is up in the air. So here's a kind of famous example. Nobody knows if this series Converges or not. And if the series does converge, certainly nobody knows what it converges to. And it might seem like modern technology would sort of solve this problem for us. Why don't we just have Wolfram Alpha find the first 10 trillion partial sums and see what happens. The issue with that is that some series converge so slowly that you really, um, or rather some series diverge, but they diverge so slowly that you can't really use technology to figure it out. Um, and we'll see an example of that, the so-called harmonic series. But for now, having made that observation, I'll say, that it's often very easy to observe or to demonstrate, let's say, that a divergent series diverges so let's look at the sum from 1 to infinity of n minus 1 divided by n. 
this series diverges. And the sort of informal argument I'm going to make is that n minus one over n is usually gonna be about one. I mean, 99 over 100, 999 over 1,000, and so on. You know, as n gets big, and n is getting big, and is getting infinitely large, as n gets big, those terms are close to one. So the series is, well, we've got more or less one added to itself an infinite number of times, and that is a divergent series. That argument can be formalized in the following way. <laughs> it's called the nth term test. And it says that if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is not equal to zero, the series diverges. So going back to here, Notice that when we have, when we're using the nth term test, we're not looking at the partial sums. We're just looking at the terms of the series. The limit as n goes to infinity of n minus one over n. We can hit this with L'Hopital's rule. And we find that this limit is one. One is not to zero, so this series diverges. And this is an important test, but I cannot emphasize enough that if the limit does equal zero, this test fails and gives us no information at all. It might converge. It might diverge. That's how we're able to have a situation like this. If the nth term test was more powerful than it is, This is not it's kind now well, it's not totally obvious, but it is true that at least if we're looking at integer values of n, this is zero. You can, um but this doesn't give us any information. Um, if the limit is zero, well, we cannot apply the nth term test. We have to try something else. And the next few weeks,
rights are going to be sort of given over to that something else. If you want to know whether a series converges or diverges, and the nth term test isn't telling you, then what can you do instead? Um, I'm going to try to abbreviate this a little because I want to get to the actual application. So I think um, that this sort of material can, can be guilty of kind of abstraction. It can be guilty, even though calculus is a very applied topic of, you know, you, you're doing the textbook assignment and there are these horrible looking series that would never show up in the real world. So I'll try to slightly minimize this. Still, there are limits to what I can do. This, the calculus curriculum is standard across the state and possibly across the entire country. And, and 